This is Duke University. Gladys Bentley is a long forgotten black queer performer from the Harlem Renaissance era. Her doing her day had to deal with the realities of everyday racism and everyday homophobia. Bentley's legacy has been recalled in the work of a Durham based artist, Charlotte Ammons, in her new recording, A Twilight for Gladys Bentley. Charlotte Ammons joins us in studio today with Sharon Patricia Holland, author of the new book, The Erotic Life of Racism. I'm Mark Anthony Neal, and this is Left to Black. Yeah. Eric, you're a real life chief for this one. <laughs> yeah. Good afternoon, and welcome to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal, and I'm happy to have in studio today to my right, Charlotte Ammons, who is about to release her new recording, Twilight for Gladys Bentley. And next to her, my long friend, a longtime friend and colleague, Sharon Patricia Holland, uh, here at Duke University, Department of English and Department of African and African American Studies, who's the author of a new book, The Erotic Life of Racism. <laughs> How are you doing today? Pretty good, thank you, Mark. Glad to be here. Uh, let me start with this, Charlotte. Um, who is Gladys Bentley, right? Because there are lots of folks who are going to wonder, Gladys Bentley, who's that? And talk about who she is and why you felt it was really important to connect to this woman's legacy. Cool. Um, Gladys Bentley was a 1920s uh, blues entertainer. Uh, she was a pianist and a, and a songstress. Um, she was known for having this big, raspy, mm -hmm. deep voice. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, she took a lot of songs, popular songs, and rearranged them and, took, and, made, and incorporated raunchy lyrics. Um, she was a bull dagger, which was the term of the time, meaning yeah. that she was um, kind of a butch dyke. Um, she presented like a man. Her um, signature outfit was a um, white top hat and white tuxedo. Oh, yeah. She looked sharp all the time. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, so during the 20s, she was really popular in the um, Harlem Renaissance artistic scene. Um, fast forward to McCarthyism. Out of fear of being blacklisted, she mm. uh, was cured of her lesbianism and started dressing like a woman. <laughs> got married. Got married. <laughs> um, so she went kind of from appearing to be a Cab Calloway to looking more like a Bets Bessie Smith. Um, she moved out west in um, post-McCarthyism, played a little bit in clubs out west, and then eventually uh, died kind of in obscurity in uh, 1960 at the age of 52 of pneumonia. And she got religion at the time before she died and was like on a, on a path to becoming a minister. But um, I embrace her legacy as an entertainer, as a, as a queer performer, as a queer musician, um, because I look at uh, the, the risk that she took and really consider my ability to go on stage comfortable in, in my body and who I am. Uh, she was definitely one of the progenitors of that for me. I mean, Sharon, talk a little bit about this. We have so many examples of these obscure figures, you know, who were giants in their own time. Mm -hmm. You know, how important is it, you know, for someone like Charlotte to do a project that really does reclaim Gladys Bentley's legacy and forces us to really think different? Because in some ways, she's Lady Gaga before well, Lady absolutely. Gaga. Absolutely. Right, but no one knows who Gladys Bentley is. Well, I think nowadays, you know, people are inclined to think that we're inventing the wheel every time yeah. we do something yeah. queer and wonderful and fabulous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But quite frankly, you know, these figures have been there, you know, from, you know, every time period has a Gladys yeah. Bentley. Yeah. Yeah. All we need to do is just figure out who she is and, you know, where she lived, we'll find her. Um, I also wanted to kind of speak to, like, the definition you have for Bentley mode cool. here, because I think that that really will tell folks what it means for an artist to go back in time, right? Bentley take, mode, take time travel, right? Time travel, time right? Travel, right? Yeah. Exactly, right? <laughs> go back in time and then bring something forward and then actually challenge academics like myself to really rethink some of our queer categories. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to read your definition cool. of Bentley mode, get you to talk about it a little bit. Bentley mode, an existence that is black against blackness, peculiar against queerness, sexual against sexuality, secure against insecurity, and aggressively striking against all angles of passivity. Bentley mode is to be hyper everything, mm -hmm. even and especially in environments where values of social marginalization are shared. That's a lot of words. That's a lot, that's a mouthful, right? <laughs> a lot of words for you. Right? Yeah, absolutely. 
<laughs> well, what I was thinking was, um, I, I, in the simplest, simplest, my, my first and simplest thought was to think about um, Gladys Bentley as uh, using the music of her time, the, the music of prowess of her mm -hmm. time, which was blues music, mm -hmm. to create this really brash presentation. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hmm, what would that music be for me if I wanted to come out really brash and crash and raunchy? It would have to be hip hop. That's the music uh, of prowess mm -hmm. and, and, and posturing mm -hmm. of our time. Absolutely. But then within those circles that already do that, there, 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 seem to, there seem to be people, usually black and usually queer, that do it a little harder, do it a little more, do it a little <laughs> extra. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about um, Grace Jones in that respect, yeah, I think yeah. about Sylvester in that respect. They were already a part of this marginalized community. Uh, how do you feel about Nikki in, in this respect? Nikki Minaj. Oh, <laughs> good question. Nikki, some call me wrong. Because she's, she's not queer identified in the way that we would recognize right. it, but, but there's something that's very queer about, right. about Nikki Minaj's performance. Well, I think, I think that's a good question. I think when, when I say queer, I mean, queer rising the mainstream. So gotcha. in that sense, yeah. Nicki Minaj would be uh, definitely a part of that. But but Nicki Minaj, would, would she represent Bentley mode? Not necessarily, yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah. I think uh, Mickey Blanco would represent mm. Bentley mode. Oh like gosh. that's the that's the mm -hmm. extra push mm -hmm. within the, the already marginal. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, you know, think about, um, you know, it's only, uh, it was never there, but think about like a, a Studio 54 vibe where you got all, all these mm -hmm. freaks and queers and yeah. weirdos. Yeah. But within that, imagine a Grace Jones walking into the room. Right, right. Like, and who's, so she, who's she's, the queerest? She's extra, who's the right. blackest? Right. Who's the biggest mm -hmm. in the room? Mm -hmm. and, I, and that's kind of like, you know, I think Bentley Mode is a combination of all these hyper everything. You mentioned that extra piece, and, and, and it makes me think a little bit about Frank Ocean, right? Because mm -hmm. there was something mm -hmm. very, for lack of a better phrase, bourgeois, mm -hmm. <laughs> about the way that Frank Ocean kind of managed mm -hmm. <laughs> his coming out, if you could even call it that, right. that really in some ways does not really create a progressive space mm. for queer artists, right. you know, who aren't going to be able to ushered into the mainstream sure. with Jay-Z on one side and Beyonce in the room and, you know, and Ellen, right. <laughs> you know, being introduced <laughs> on Ellen one day. Um, yeah. it, 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 does Frank Ocean coming out, again, if we could even call it that, um, really create a more hospitable space for queer artists? Mm. Well, I'm not necessarily sure. Um, I think a lot of the coming out was, you know, cleaned up yeah, in many ways, nice. right? Let's put it this way: he didn't have sanitized. Very, exactly, he didn't <laughs> really have a rough landing, you yeah. know. And it was kind of um, packaged into, well, you know, these things kind of happen, and it's good to celebrate all kinds of love. But I don't think that I, I think you know, Charlotte's right. It's not quite Bentley mode. It's not quite pushing the envelope of not just what other kinds of genders you can love but the kind of love you, you have together right. and where you can have it, right? right? Um, you know, he didn't necessarily go walking hand in hand, you know, mm -hmm. with his lover into church on Sunday, mm -hmm. right? And, and, you know, it's, ex it's, it's more like an experiment. And mm -hmm. it was almost a tone of apology, I think, with, with, by how san sanitary it seemed. And I'm sure, I'm, at the same time, it, it still rang true with this, uh, it was so mainstream and so uh, well, well packaged and well received that, it's hard to call it um, something that opened doors, per se. Somebody like me who's still kind of uh, in, a, in a position of playing underground, for if yeah. that term even yeah. exists still. Yeah. But um, I mean, it's worth applauding for sure, but can it, can it be pushed a bit? Can it be challenged It's not the end game. Right, right. No, it's not, not it's, it's, it's yeah. the beginning of a process. Right. Mm -hmm. You're watching Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony. We're joined this afternoon on the couch with Charlotte Ammons, who's talking about her brand new CD, Twilight for Gladys Bentley. We're also joined by English professor Sharon Patricia Holland here at Duke University, author of several books, including the classic Raising the Dead, <laughs> and also the just released The Erotic Life of Racism. Both of those are Duke University Press. You have some other thoughts uh, about Bentley Mode, Sharon? Oh boy, I have lots of thoughts about <laughs> Bentley Mode, but I think I'd like to start with the song and some of the lyrics of the song. That the song I feel really best represents that, and that's "Sexy Cerebellum." Yeah. Yeah. And, the and it, it's funny because Sharon and I were at a conference, right? You talk about <laughs> like a Bentley time. Here we were at Harvard at, at oh, a queer <laughs> hip hop studies <laughs> conference, right? that by far is probably the best hip hop studies conference I've ever been to. Absolutely. And Sharon plays Sexy Cerebellum and it's like it just changed 
this space, wow. right? It's like, it was, it was like listening to the future hip hop, if you will. Lovely. Right. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. People really walked into the space of that, that song. So I want you to talk a little bit about it. Well, um, directly it's about my partner. Um, but the, the, whole, the song is about uh, how do we incorporate uh, intellectualism into sexiness and mm -hmm. uh, sexual attraction. So um, sexy cerebellum is about having a sexy brain and also being uh, this, being a feminist who embraces her sexuality and sex positive. And mm -hmm. so um, the song kind of champions that. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I, I wanted to also um, talk a little bit about, because I think Sexy Cerebellum gets the kind of Gladys Bentley mode, but there's also something else going on in your music and all your other collaborations, some of your poetry, some of the bands you work with local, locally. And I first became attuned to, uh, your, you know, I've known your music before, but really kind of, you know, caught, caught my eye when I was at a Justin Robinson and the Marion, Marionettes um, concert. And you performed on a track called Kissin' and Cussin'. Mm -hmm. right. um, and and for the, the audience, track. Justin Robinson, yes. of course, is a member of the Carolina Chocolate Drops. Right. 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 Just right. dropped his solo album, I think. Yeah, well, you know, and now he does the group. marionettes. Gra Gra Grammy Nets. Award. Grammy Award. Award. <laughs> right. Award yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I want to. I want you to talk a little bit about your your brief collaboration there and the kind of like Kakalaki or Nor you know North Carolina vibe. You know why North Carolina? What's going on in the music scene? How do you feel? You know you're contributing to it here. I think um, Justin, prob in many ways, is the, one of the best representations of what's going on. I mean, uh, there's so much rich richness in his mm -hmm. music in terms of the way he digs in the crates, his relationship with Joe Thompson, mm -hmm. and Absolutely. and how that. He didn't just take that music and say, I'm just going to bring it into a present. He said, I'm going to take that music and add the present to it and create mm -hmm. a new recipe. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's to me, that's the pushing the boundaries, taking the risks, and, and creating And, and create you have all sound. these interesting, I mean, you got Shauna Tucker, yes, for one absolutely. example. You got The Beast. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, have someone like Nina Freelon who's right. just kind of chilling. Yeah. <laughs> but in yeah. her own way, part yeah. of the scene. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, and we're all doing work that I think is, is definitely important to the history and the cauldron of North Carolina music, um, and hopefully collectively pushing some boundaries. Um, Justin's stuff is just amazing. amazing I mean, yeah. 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 Do you consider yourself a hip-hop artist, or is your definition of your music much broader than that? Well, it kind of has to be broader, because I feel like this album is like the, my best effort at a hip-hop record, right. but there's so much music infused at this point, yeah. like after doing it for so long and uh, playing mostly for the last 10 years with rock bands yeah. and, you know, kind of coming full circle with, with coming back to hip-hop in some senses. Um, but I always rhyme, I always, it's part of my vocal it's part, yeah. repertoire. I, you know, I think about that because, you know, when we hear conversations in the mainstream, right, the mainstream will tell us that there's no space for queerness in hip-hop. Yeah. I mean, that Absolutely. was part of the whole symbolism of, yeah. the, of the Frank Ocean, even though Frank Ocean himself is not a hip-hop artist, right? right? He's kind of on the fringes of that. But, but when I think about how things are playing out, you know, among independent artists mm -hmm. in the underground, I was just listening to this great track um, called Candidates for Sale, mm -hmm. um, and it's just Siri X. Invincible out of Detroit yeah. and, and Rhyme Fest, and I'm just thinking about the irony. Yeah. Here you have the wow. the rapper, Na Nation of Islam minister term rapper, yeah. with the Jewish lesbian. Yeah, I know. <laughs> right, I know. with, with the shy time yeah. rapper coming, <laughs> what, and, and, what and it's a kind of collaboration mm -hmm. that you would have never have imagined. Right. Ten years ago, Absolutely. right, or, or fifteen years ago. Not openly. Yeah. No, where everybody's identities is on the table and a part of what they what they're bringing to the track, to the song, to the experience, and. Um, are, you know, and it, it, I think the anticipation of being over it for in, a, in order for us to create music is so based on all the isms that, that you know you address in your work. It's you know it, it's it's the risk taking. We have to take the risk. I mean, uh, there's no way at this point, at 38 years old, that I can create music where I'm leaving any part of myself behind. Mm. That's mm. just mm -hmm. you know. Not authentic. That's real. Yeah, and yeah <laughs> yes. exactly. Right. That, I mean, that's not someone coming into the industry thinking that they have to listen to the industry's terms on how to do this because they're trying to have a career. Right. Right. This is someone in which there's an integrity about the work in terms of you, Charlotte, well, that, thank you. that there's no choice, right? This is what I am, who I am, and this is what the music is going to look right. like, despite whatever you know other naysayers might say. About and I trust that there's an audience for that. Yeah, I trust absolutely. that there's an audience. It's proven. Always, an, honesty, always an audience for honesty. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. 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 
I definitely think, you know, we've been so circumscribed by what blackness is not supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You know, we've yeah. we've kind of you know we don't really know what the definitions. Well, what is it? People, you know, there's multiple definitions, but really it's been defined by what we shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the collaboration that you did with Justin, um, just you know, some of the cuts on the album, you know, really forcing us to think about all the ways in which, you know, all the places in which you live, right. all the ways in which you you know exist, you know. So I think this, there's, there's room for integrity because I left hip-hop for a long time. Mm. And I've just now, in the last couple of years, been like listening to stuff that I've always li listened to Tim and West and, right. and others, but I've been really kind of getting back and noticing yeah. it. Mm. And, and shout out to Tim and West, Duke grad. Duke grad was my student yeah. at Stanford for a brief time. He's amazing. Yes. Amazing. Right on. Yeah. And I'm, I'm constantly asking, like, how much of this can I be? How much more black can I be? How much more queer can I be? How much more woman can I be? Mm. How much more southern can I be? Mm -hmm. And and how and and, and and there's a piece of it that gets lost, right? Yeah. How much more southern can uh, I be? Right? Yeah. What did it mean to fold all of that into the idea of it's, being a southern hip hop right. artist, right? And it's not necessarily about a twang, or it's not necessarily. It's about definitely the the even in the in what I consider my uh, rhyme style. It's based in an oral tradition. It's, I'm often telling yeah. stories. I'm often folding in anecdotes that are long, age old, anecdotes that I grew up with from my grandma and, my, and, and granddaddy passed on down. Um, so that, that that identity of being able to, um, and then folding it in with a slight level of common sense, which yeah. is, <laughs> you know, that's like, kind of, you know, an anticipation, you know, okay, what's the, the punchline to the parable almost? And, and an air of humor and, a, and an air of lightheartedness, but talking about stuff that's really, you know, intense and, and, mm -hmm. and sincere. Um, yeah. But it all goes back to being an observer, too. Mm -hmm. Which I think is a Southern aesthetic, mm -hmm. sitting and watching for a while before you say <laughs> anything. anything. <laughs> so so that, that was the thing. The, about those, those black women sitting on the porch. Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. who, who knew everything. Absolutely. Right, right. Which is kind of captured in the video. Oh, yeah. In many ways, we take a chance. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, you get that kind of coming out the house. You know, hey, what's up? You yeah. know, let's go sit on the lawn for yeah. a little bit, right? <laughs> and in a hurry to go nowhere. Exactly. Right. Exactly. It'll be there when I get there. That's yeah. yeah. Talk sure a little about the challenges these days, and you know, it might not be challenges in terms of being an artist, mm -hmm. where you don't have to deal with a record company per se, mm -hmm. where so much of the dis distribution apparatus is now back in your hands right. with things like iTunes, mm -hmm. with uh, you know the internet and particularly YouTube mm -hmm. you know where you can immediately deliver your product to a broader audience mm -hmm. without having to write a check to someone at Clear Channel right, <laughs> right to get it played on a radio yeah. stage you talk about both the pitfalls of, of being this independent artist but what are really some opportunities afforded of being an independent artist right. at this point well you spoke to the beauty of it you have direct access no middlemen to right. your audience um, and that's great because you're asking you can and you can interact in real time um, folks can engage and ask questions or challenge you on stuff, and yeah. then part of it is part of this whole uh, uh, Twilight for Gladys Bentley thing is I anticipate critique right. because I'm anticipating that I'm going to be saying some stuff on dandelion eating out that people ain't going necessarily <laughs> get with. It. And, and so, just always oh, <laughs> listen to the title. We can yeah, I know, I know. Like, <laughs> and, and, and it's all good. Track, or is right. this misogynist or is this sexist? Because because that term that comes up, fuckable feminism. Yeah, I, talk, I, fuck, I know. That that's a that's bit, sexy, right? Sarah. This is left to black, so we can go there. Oh right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know. I was hoping you get to it earlier. I'm glad you came back around. <laughs> no, and, and and even you know introducing terms like that to a project that you hope people are critical about. There's a air of of risk taking and fear. Mm -hmm. Like the first time we performed sexy cerebellum or dandelion eat now I did this whole long disclaimer that I will never do again <laughs> I will not do that again but like you know just standing behind you know the premise of the record and also the premise that or the the history that I'm really trying to channel of of raunchy music that also mm -hmm. resonates and, and makes people tingle but also makes pe make people listen and, and that's the thing that gets lost right I mean when we think about you know sexually explicit music on the airwaves mm -hmm. now, right? I mean, first of all, there's almost something, there's, there's a lack of maturity about right. it, right? And, and it's one thing to be in the car, if I'm in the car of my daughters, they're 14 and 9, right. Right? and something that's sexually explicit comes on, at least with the 9-year-old now, right. it's like, that's very different than being a group of adults. Right. <laughs> in a club, right. right, expecting to enjoy each other's company right. in which 
part of that is is sharing this raunchy music, right? Yeah. And, and that's the tradition of black, I mean, that's Jelly Roll Morton yeah. talking about go get me a palette, right? Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is our music, yeah, right? And in some way, and somehow we've almost sanitized right. ourselves from this so part of our history. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know what's Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith, I mean, yeah, exactly, I exactly. And what's funny is I think, you know, people still need permission to go there, audiences yeah. sometimes, uh, and it's about social pressures and yeah. of decorum and, Oh, can you really say fuckable feminist? Can I be a feminist? And I'm like, yo, any any sex positive feminist in the house, and any fuckable feminist in the house, and you'll see a couple that have <laughs> had a little more drinks than everybody else actually respond. But when, then when people take the music home and actually sit with it and and say like, why can't I be brilliant and sexually at the same, same time? Yeah, same time. and and we we were we used to be that we used to be that way. Even, you know, think about um, even I was writing over listening to Betty Davis, yeah. like just straight classic, on. Classic, Betty Davis classic example. Is yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes, and I'm like, I I just would love to be able to bring all all mm. myself to to the club, you know, and not have to turn my brain off to grind and not have to turn my pelvic off to to think. think. <laughs> you know, can I just bring it all? That's a great line. Yeah. <laughs> so Sharon, tell us a little bit about the erotics of racism. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the erotic life of racism. Well, the erotic life of racism really grew out of uh, an experience I had in California a long time ago. Um, where, I, it's a long story, but I went to, to park my car, parked my car next to this woman. She asked me to move my car. Um, there was nobody parked on the other side of my car, so I thought, that's kind of strange. So I said, look, I'll stay in my car, hang out with my friend's daughter while you put your groceries in. And then as I passed the rear bumper of her car, she um, said to me, um, to think I marched for you. Wow. And I was with my friend's daughter, who's, 70, who's 15, yeah. who was 15 at the time, and Tupac Shakur had just passed. And so I was just like, well, um, I don't really know what to do here. And I thought about just walking away. But instead, I thought I had to do something to model for Danielle, like mm -hmm. what to do in that situation. So. Yeah. Danielle was just like, you know, you did no, you didn't, you know, <laughs> and I just basically turned to her and I said, you know, you didn't, you didn't march for me, you march for yourself, and if you don't understand that, I can't help you. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so the book really comes out of experience that's about, it's about quotidian racism, really, not about spectacular racism, mm -hmm. the kind of racism we're always used to on the news that everybody can get together over coffee mm -hmm. and agree about, everybody can kind of feel good about. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was a horrible thing. This is about the everyday acts um, that kind of slay us. And so I wanted to kind of couple that with, um, in queer studies, the notion of the erotic. Mm -hmm. And the erotic is, is autonomous. And I wanted to kind of challenge the idea of the erotic as an autonomous space, mm -hmm. where we can kind of go and it's messy and we can mess around and there are no consequences. Mm -hmm. Because I, feel, I felt that there was something about quotidian racism that had also something to do with the erotic. And I found it in you know, the kind of partners people choose. Mm -hmm the kind of sperm donor they're looking for. You know, all of these things that we consider culturally okay. But, you know, are they actually constitutive of the stuff of racism? I started to ask myself that question. Or the practice of racism. So, the book is really an exploration across critical race theory, feminist theory, and queer theory. I'm trying to get them all to talk to one another in a deep way. Mm. Kind of like a Bentley mode. <laughs> And so when I found Bentley mode, I was just like, why didn't I have this <laughs> for the book? <laughs> We've been joined this afternoon uh, in studio, Charlotte Ammons talking about her brand new album, Twilight for Gladys Bentley, mm -hmm. uh, that hopefully you'll all be able to check out real soon. Absolutely. Sharon Patricia Holland, old friend, Definitely. longtime colleague, English department, Duke University, African American Studies, Duke University, African and African American Studies, Duke mm -hmm. University, and the author of the new book, the Erotic Life of Racism, Duke University Press, and also the classic Raising the Dead, <laughs> also Duke University Press. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Yeah. Eric, you're a real lot cheap for this one. <laughs> yeah. All black everything. All black, you know. All black in the name of all my black heroes. All black everything. All black polos, all black medallions, yeah, all black, you know, say, all black everything, all black, you know, all black in the name of all my black heroes.